Hey folks, this is David Voorhees in Draconia, North Carolina. I'm a potter here and I'm going to be doing a live stream broadcast, a uh, little tour of my wood-fired pottery kiln. So I um, built this kiln in 2009 and uh, I'm actually standing outside my studio. So I have a studio building that Molly shares the upstairs, my wife, Molly Sharp. And uh, then I have this outside set of buildings I'm getting ready to show you. So. My kiln's right behind me. Uh, that's the door of it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the camera around and I'll give you a little tour. I want you to see it from a distance to start with. So let me turn my camera around. And you see we live in a beautiful little hollow. We call it Sunburst Hollow. Got some nice garden area, little guest cottage over there. My woodshed is pretty depleted now because we just fired and there's the kiln. I'm going to walk you around, and uh, I'm, if I have any connectivity issues, I may have to jump back inside, but I will come back on. So this is a wood-fired car kiln. It's fairly unusual. I've only found about five in the whole world. I've been kind of researching on this. Um, we did just fire it, so uh, and I usually don't clean up for a while. But so we have on this end a firebox, and then the car is down there. And I've got some stuff to show you on this. So um, if you uh, have an interest in wood-fired kilns and want, uh, want to ask any questions or even just general questions, I'm happy to answer them. I'll try and, um, as, as I'm showing you around, uh, I should answer uh, lots of the different kinds of questions that you have about wood firing. Of course, I have different kinds of kilns. I have three electric kilns inside. They're all computer operated, so I push a button. I also have, I'll just show you briefly over here, a uh, gas-fired kiln. It's got four propane burners, two on each side. Uh, we've only fired it a couple times. A group of us built this and um, are still figuring it out. So um, but we get a little bit different results from each kiln. So back to the wood kiln. Uh, this is the firebox end. <clears throat> so this is where we build the fire. We start with the little fire door at the bottom. And we just build a little, little fire in there and you start things kind of slow. Um, we have to heat. The inside of the kiln is lined with dense um, fire bricks, high heat duty fire, fire bricks. And it takes a long time for them to get fully charged with heat. And we're firing up to 23, 2350 Fahrenheit. Um, it takes about 30 hours to fire this kiln. So it takes probably five or six hours of firing in the lower fire door. And it's just uh, bricks on the bottom there. Then we move to the upper chamber when it gets hot enough to ignite in here. And I'm going to try going in here. I don't think you can see, but you might be able to see some grates in there. So there are actually three bars across the their, um, bricks, actually. And the bricks, when I throw a log in there, the uh, log sits up on the bricks and catches fire. And uh, then I have this fire door here, which I will attempt to use one hand to hold my iPad. My iPad, I can see. So it's on barn rollers. Just a simple, I tried to come up with an inexpensive way to do a door. It's lined with ceramic fiber insulation, white uh, high temperature fiber. And I replace that. Um, it's about ready to be replaced. And I have the exact same thing on the bottom set up and I actually have two rails for the bottom one to go on so I can put it up a little higher and it lets more air in the bottom. In the beginning of the fire you need more air in there. The top we control uh, in the air up here. Anyhow it's very easy it's right at um, um, you know waist above waist high kind of mid chest high um, so it's e very easy to load and um, uh, it's a comfortable fire and for most of the firing one person can do it. The problem is it takes too long. It takes at least 30, 36 hours to fire it. So that means at least one overnight. So we do shifts. We usually do four to six hour shifts with um, uh, a group of potters up to probably six or eight potters. Um, and that helps me but not only fire the kiln, we take turns doing it. Uh, at the end, I usually have at least three people here to help with the um, end. It gets a little fast and furious. We're working hard to achieve temperature. And then we are also um, having to do a spray soda in it. So I do a form of salt glazing uh, that it was developed by um, the Germans. Um, I've read various stories about it. I don't know if there's a definitive 
uh, way that salt began being introduced into a kiln, uh, but they found that it vaporized and it formed a glaze on the outside of the raw clay. So we use that to effect here. Um, I have used a little bit of salt in this kiln, but mostly I use soda, soda ash, and uh, water combined. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So down here I have my kiln shelves, and they're made out of um, either silicon carbide or corderite, which is a highly refractory material, clay material, and they are, um, I've got a few posts there, varying heights. Um, and they usually have the white uh, compound that's painted on them as we call kiln wash, and it's just a refractory clay coating that won't, uh, makes things not stick so much. So they got little sticks between them because we've just had them cleaned. One of the potters who fires with me, uh, Zach, had just came out here and he ground them all down and, and got them all cleaned up and then put a new coat of kiln wash on them. And we usually do that with the bricks. We dip them in there too. So, um, so over here I have a uh, this part going from the, let me back up a little bit. The firebox is this unit here. There's this little transition chamber here that has a pizza oven on the top and it has this little door down here because this is actually a really good place to put pots. We have not been super successful with it, but it gets really, really hot. We're thinking 2400 above and it um, gets lots of wood ash too. So it's like an anagama kiln, which is a very different kind of firing than we do here, which is a wood soda kiln. So I've got a few pots here um, to show you the results from this type of kiln. Uh, the one on the middle was in the, on the bag wall. I'm going to show you what the bag wall is and the little tea bowl and the pitcher. These are all stoneware pieces here. Were fired in the main chamber uh, in the stack of kiln shells and things. Um, so you can kind of see some of the um, variation in colors. That comes from, hello Mohammed, how are you? Uh, comes from um, the uh, the wood ash floating through there, the flames licking around the pot, and then the soda being sprayed into it. And you may wonder what these are. Hope I, Muhammad, you're a potter, aren't you? I think that's how we know each other. These are pyrometric cones. So I use pyrometric cones, as do most potters um, um, that have access to them, uh, to determine the end temperature that I'm achieve, trying to achieve. And the one I really wanted there, the one that where the two of them standing up, is I wanted that one to the left to be bending over a little bit. That's cone 10. Somewhere in the cone 9 to 10 range, I get really nice results. But this picture, which I think came out spectacular, was, and the thing was uh, barely cone 9 back in the stack, but on the bag wall, that was probably cone 11 there, so it got lots of heat there. So anyhow, and behind it is this little pizza oven that I just figured out I could uh, add it to it. So... Um, after each firing at the end of it, uh, the oven's all heated up, so we actually, um, everybody brings some, um, we don't do this during COVID, but we normally, everybody brings um, toppings, and I make a bunch of pizza dough, and we make, oh, from four to 20 pizzas, so uh, it's a lot of fun, so. Holly, you're back. Welcome. So I'm showing out my, showing off my wood fire kiln, so now we're getting down to the last part is the wear chamber. So the wear chamber, and I've got a door here. And I'll back up a little so you can see it. Let me back up first. So it's a car kiln or a trolley kiln. And it's on tracks. Can you see the two angle iron tracks down there? And the door is made out of soft brick. Everything else on the hot face of it or on the inside is hard bricks. Um, and to get the car in, I can push, I can barely push it when it's empty by myself. But when it's loaded, we have to be careful and we use a boat winch. And we also use something called a snatch block. Now, I don't know if everybody knows what a snatch block is. Y'all probably do. I didn't. Uh, James, how are you? So um, this is a pulley that breaks apart. And it became instrumental in me figuring out, I'm going to actually show you this if I can. So it has two leaves that can spread apart. That means that I can take the, um, the cable out of the, the uh, snatch block and use the same boat winch to both pull in the car and pull it back out at the end of the firing. So um, 
it took me a lot of ruminating to figure that out, but it was it was one of those what a simple simple uh, solution to the problem of how I take something really heavy and get it in. So I'm getting into the wear chamber. I'll probably take a second for the light to adjust here. Now um, this is a traditional sprung arch kiln, so it's got a, a curved top, um, which actually is a round part of a round circle. It has a certain radius and a uh, um, I can't remember what that is. 39 inches maybe 44 inches it's been a while so hello Leslie thanks for joining us um, if you're joining me uh, this is David Voorhees I'm doing a little tour of my wood-fired kiln that I built here in Zirconia North Carolina and um, my uh, live stream is part of the Voorhees family art show thing so um, we have still have one more demonstration after this and then we're coming to the end of our uh, time, but all of these videos and live streams are all available on our website, which is VorheesFamilyArt.com. So on the inside of my kiln uh, is a coating with the beautiful colors. Let's see if I can get a little closer so you can see. Hang on. Can you see how it almost looks sugary and crystalline? And this is where it's gotten sprayed with the soda over a number of times. Even get some blues back in there really is pretty cool um, and we have fired this kiln 35 times over the years since 2009 when I built it and I didn't build it by myself I kind of designed it as I went and I had about 20 different people help me build it I would kind of figure out the next part of the kiln and then I would hire not hire excuse me I would <laughs> ask for volunteers and people would come out of the woodworks and we'd have a work day and we'd clean bricks or we'd and lay the back wall or we do the top arch and stuff like that so um the uh let's see let me show you the exit flues because they're the easiest to show these are these four little slots down here these are where the flames leave the uh, wear chamber i'll show you where they come in in just a minute but i'm going to back up a little bit because the chimney is the if you have a wood-fired kiln the chimney is is kind of like you build everything around the chimney because if your chimney's not big enough, hello Sarah, she knows about this kiln. She helped me fire it this last time. Well, you didn't help much, but you had some beautiful pots come out. Next time, you got to help me. So this is um, uh, a fairly large chimney, and it's about 13 feet tall, um, and it takes a long time to heat it up. So the first thing I do after I load my pots in the kiln is I turn on a gas burner at the base of the chimney. So I'm going to walk around the other side so you can see the bag wall. Sorry for the, the light adjust a little bit. So now I'm looking at the flues that bring the flames into there. There's actually six of them, three smaller ones on top of three taller ones. And then in front of them, I have this loose uh, wall with openings in it. And I actually go up one more course of bricks and then have a solid top across it. And that's called a bag wall. And a bag wall's job is to deflect the flame up and... Uh, I'm not sure what else, but it um, it's necessary in this. If I didn't have it, the flames would want to go straight across the bottom of the kiln, and the bottom would be rolled hot, and the top would be, we call it cool, but it'd be 50 degrees cooler than it should be. So the idea uh, took uh, several firings to, um, uh, to determine the height and the density of the bag wall, and now I have it in pretty good shape, so it works pretty well. And on top of the bag wall is where I put pots, tall, thin pots, and that's where the green one came from. I'll show it to you before, but again, you can see the coating on the inside of the kiln. Now, we do a form of soda glazing and uh, or salt firing, which we use soda, and the little ports in the back, we also view cones in there, but the ones over here are three of the main ones we do for soda, and then I have another uh, six on the, uh, three on the door and three next to the door on this side of it. So I want to show you, and you can see down here, you see the tracks going into the kiln. So I want to show you a little bit more about some of the tools that I have to use here. Let me come around the other side again. Sorry about that. Y'all are very patient. And my iPad just told me I have about 10, 10 more, 10% um, 10 on my battery. So I do a form of uh, soda glazing. Now Sarah has just done one and the resort, results look fabulous. I think she's hooked on it now. So I use a, um, a commercial grade um, 
a garden sprayer here and it pumps up and we actually turn soda ash. So this is soda ash. Everybody wonder what, what does soda ash look like? You know what salt looks like? It's just a white grainy, white grainy powder here. And um, so I mix it with hot water. I get it into solution. I put it in there and I have about three gallons altogether and I put about four or five, five pounds of soda and then it gets sprayed in here. It takes about a oh, half hour, 45 minutes to spray it in. These are the little holes that I would spray it into. And I have a copper wand on the end of my sprayer, which you can see right there. And I did clean it and it looks like I need to clean it some more. Anyhow, it holds up for a while and then you gotta replace it. Oh, uh, so, I've, got a, I've got a visitor. Molly is saying hi to everybody. So I'm okay. telling about what's coming up next. That's what I'm here for. Okay, good. So up next, four o'clock, we're gonna demonstrate and show you how we make our silver ceramic jewelry up in my studio. All right, see you in just a little bit. So you get things you, ready, okay? See you at four o'clock. <laughs> okay, thanks, Molly. I'm very blessed to be married to such a wonderful lady and uh, another artist, too. We get to compare notes. So some of the other tools that we need to use, uh, uh, I use this old grinder here. It's just a cheap grinder uh, for grinding back all kinds of things that happen in refractory. Uh, yeah, they get to be a mess. I uh, not only use pyrometric cones, but I also use a digital pyrometer. Um, and I've got several of these. They're bad for, these are fairly cheap, cheap one here. Uh, they'll go bad on you. The batteries will go bad and you plug in another one. And we use them mostly to determine the rate of climb that we are climbing. They are not as accurate as the cones are that I mentioned. For those who join late, I'll show you the pyrometric cones. This is gives us the final... Um, tell all of the temperature in the kiln. If the cones are bending the way we like them, that means the glazes are melting the way we like them. So that's what we use. And this is the pot that was on the bag wall I mentioned. So it got really hot. It looks great. Uh, some of the other tools are uh, safety equipment. So um, we have lots of gloves. We use welder's gloves. Those are the ones I like best. Gloves last a couple of firings. They knew the mice get to them or they get too hot and they get stiff. Um, at the end of the firing, when I'm spraying the soda and when it gets really bright inside, you really need to protect your eyes. So we use, uh, I should use welding glasses. These are safety, dark safety glasses. I also have a big iron rod here uh, uh, with a poker. So we do a lot of pushing the coals around and stuff like that with, with my trusty poker, so you always have some metal things. And I also wanted to show you this stuff. Uh, I'm one of the few potters that uses this. This is, let me get in the shade here. This is called ceramic fiber paper. So you can see how thick it is. It's a little thicker than a matchbook cover. I think it's maybe an eighth inch, something like that. And it is made out of the same thing that the ceramic fiber insulation is. It's just pressed and it has a binder in it. And what I do is I put it and use it as a seal. So I put it up on the side of the door wherever it would come into the car door would come into contact. So all across the top and around the sides and then around inside the air. And this helps keep me from having the car stick to the walls and the inside. If uh, a car, uh, anybody owns a car kiln worries about their car sticking and how you'll get your pots out. I, I've had a couple of times where I got worried. But this ceramic fiber insulation has worked great. I have to replace it each time, but it costs maybe $10 to uh, do it. I buy it in big rolls and cut it into strips. And then to stick it there, that was another one of those ingenious uh, aha moments when I realized that uh, flour and water make a wonderful paste. And you just slap it on the back of it and stick it up. And then when it's cooking, uh, as it heats up, the, um, it smells like baking bread. So it's pretty cool. So. So let's the inside there. Um, again, it takes 30 to 36 hours. Then what do you do afterwards? Is we close it up. I have two dampers in the back. It's too hard to get around there, but um, I end up closing them all the way up after I let the uh, embers burn down a little bit. And then I, um, um, I start closing up all the ports. So these are actually primary air ports and I'll put a bigger brick in there. Uh, everything that you see open, of course, is all bricked up during the firing. This is just the door that's bricked up. Those are the bricks there that go in there. Everything gets clammed up. So basically, oh, you're back. Okay, I'm back. Uh, anyhow, I'm inside where I'm closer to my internet. I'm going to sign off here. Um, these are some pots that came out of that. Of course, all of these things are on 
my uh, Etsy shop. Everything can be found through VorheesFamilyArt.com. And we do have a raffle going on. we got a couple more hours to uh, buy tickets. Uh, all the money goes to We Give a Share, a local nonprofit uh, helping to feed people and train uh, chefs. And these are some things I did a demo yesterday. I'm working on my little drink cups that'll be Scrafito Carr. So thank you for uh, watching, everybody. And um, uh, thanks for helping support uh, local artists. Y'all take care and see you soon.